Hello everyone, SIUK Thailand is live with Cranfield University. Over to you, Melvin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to introduce myself. I am Professor Melvin Peters, and I'm a professor of supply chain practice, but I'm also the director of education in the School of Management at Cranfield University. That means I'm responsible for all the taught award bearing programs, the MSc and the MBA. And this, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about MSCs. So welcome to you all. Let us commence. Um, we're going to split the uh, session into three parts. I'm going to give you an introduction to the School of Management and our MSc programs. I'm then going to give you a sort of a, a taster session where I'm just going to talk very quickly about the last mile probably or, or what we would call the e-commerce delivery problem and just take a particular case which is based around the Amazon drone investment just to give you a, an insight into that particular area. And then we'll follow that with a questions and answers session where I will try and answer your questions regarding the courses that you might be interested in at the School of Management. So three, three parts to this presentation. Um, Bramfield is a, a, an unusual university in that it is solely postgraduate. So the university grew up out of a a technological engineering background. And within that, it developed its own distinct and separate school of management. So we have over 50 years of experience in educating organizations and students. And our mantra, it really, our, our philosophy is knowledge into action. We, we like to see our, our intellectual property being developed and used in the real world. So very much our philosophy is seeing how students migrate into careers which will have impact. So yes, we're exclusively postgraduate and we focus on practical outcomes. We're also at an elite school of management in as much as we are triple accredited with the three main bodies. So AACSB, Equus and Amber, we're, we are accredited. That makes us unique in as much as about just under 2% of all business and management schools globally have that triple accreditation. Our individual programs themselves are highly ranked. I'm, I'm not gonna go for each one in individually. You can check the ranking of each one on the program web pages on our on our website but all of our programs are highly ranked um, and, and that really is a, an external endorsement about the quality of the programs that we produce and the careers that our students go into i would stress also that the university is considered to be exceptionally good at personal development there is a UK ranking system called the Postgraduate Port Survey, which the UK government runs. And we regularly top um, the experts in personal development section. In fact, we rank higher than the prestigious Russell Group universities in the UK. We have very strong links with industry um, and we focus on applied learning. So that in a nutshell is a sort of the structure of how we see the university and the School of Management in particular. In terms of our MSc programs, um, they range from general through to specialist, and they also range from what we call early career to post-work experience and career progression. All of our full-time students are on a one-year program. That's quite common in the UK. Master's programs are normally one year. Um, and the average age on, of students on those programs is, is approximately 25 to 26. But that does hide a, a, a range, but that's the average. 
the part-time students tend to be a lot older, but I'm going to focus in on, on the full-time programs. Uh, there are really two categories. In the full-time general, we have what we call the management program, the MSc in management. And then we have the specialist programs, which is uh, two finance related programs. So finance and management and investment management. We then have um, a range of management programs which run off the spine of the MSc in management. So they share a lot of modules. Melvin, you are on mute. How long have I been on mute? Just two seconds. Oh, okay. Um, so we have the management programs that run off the spine of the management program. So management and corporate sustainability, management and entrepreneurship, management and human capital or human resource management. And then we have a program which I suspect the university is um, best known for, which is the logistics and supply chain and procurement and supply chain. And then we have an MSc in strategic marketing. So we don't have a massive portfolio, but we have a well established and highly focused set of MSCs. We also have some part time programs, but I'm not going to discuss those today. So if you think about the way our programs are designed, who are they designed for? Well, all of our postgraduate students are very self-motivated. Um, they're looking for a real world business education, which means they want um, industry to come into the classroom. Uh, we want, they are specialists in, in most cases, with the exception of the MSc in management, who want to extend their skill set and knowledge so they have a particular career path that they've identified and they want the relevant skill set for that career path. They'll need to be open minded because we will challenge them uh, in the way that they develop themselves. They will have to be able to reflect on how they learn and where their weaknesses are. We want individuals who put knowledge into action. Um, and if you were a part-time student, it's about progressing your career. But for the full-time student, that's about starting your career journey in the right way. Um, and the one thing I'd say about knowledge into action is that we expect our students to have an impact in society, no matter what career they choose. So they may wish to go into industry, commerce. They may wish to go into government. They may wish to go into aid agency or um, NGO type activities, but whatever the career they choose, we would like them to have impact. So what's special about the way we deliver our programs? Well, there's a whole range of things that we do that bring the classroom and industry together. So we have a practitioner based series. So at the moment, there's a whole series of uh, externals coming in giving presentations on sustainability in their industry environments that's a a program where we have one speaker a month coming in uh, we have some modules are co-taught with practitioners so we've identified certain expertise that we wish to bring into the classroom from external all of the courses have what's known as an advisory or a practice board, which is made up of a group of uh, industrialists that tell us about the relevance of our courses and provide us with projects and ideas for how we can develop our courses. A number of our faculty have industry backgrounds, so we've recruited directly back from industry into academia. We have industry hosted events. So in December, we ran a live e-auction event uh, for our logistics and procurement students. And that involved um, 35 student teams acting as suppliers, bidding on a live e-auction event for a contract. And that was hosted for us by an industry partner called Market Dojo 
which is a specialist in the procurement space. So we had a, a real hands-on experience of being involved in a tendering process. Uh, we use a lot of case study teaching. So we all, um, what we term a flipped classroom environment, whereby you'll be given some theory prior to a session, and then you bring that theory into practice by looking at how it could be applied in a case study company. On the strategic marketing program, they have what's known as a marketing consultancy challenge. Um, a company comes in and gives a brief to the students and they're given one week to undertake a piece of research, write a report and present their findings back to the company. We have study tours on some of the programs. We have a Bloomberg suite, uh, which is a financial suite for the finance students, um, a specialist um, set of data, which resides in um, the management and information research center. We have internships on the masters in management uh, program. Uh, students actually go and work for a company for three months. Um, those can vary and can be geographically dispersed, but they will actually work for a company for three months. They will develop their thesis topic at the same time. We also have company based projects where companies submit a project uh, which can be undertaken as a, as a thesis, as a major piece of research. So there are opportunities to engage with industry. And for the more work experience based students, there are some on the full time programs as well. They will also sometimes tailor um, their project for a previous employer or their current employer. So they may have been given a year sabbatical, but they'll actually undertake their thesis project uh, for their employer. So there are lots of opportunities. I can answer some more questions about that later when we get onto the Q&A. The other thing I'd say that's special about us is because we're postgraduate, it's a more mature environment for students. So we place a lot of responsibility on them and we expect them to use that responsibly in as much as we don't have surgery hours with our students. We have an open door policy. So I'm currently supervising seven students. It is their responsibility to contact me and we will meet uh, and discuss and work on their thesis research based on their requirements. But I have an open door policy. So if they need to see me, then if I'm free, I'll see them straight away. If not, we will get something in the diary and I will see them as soon as possible. So it's not, I will see people on between four and six on a Monday. We don't operate in that style. Yeah. There's a very close relationship that builds up between the tutor and their uh, students. We use learning teams. So we put students into groups of somewhere between six and eight, and they are responsible for supporting each other during their period of study at Cranfield. And they also have a supporting tutor attached to the learning team. But it's often a way of enabling students to assist each other without necessarily having to involve the tutor. Um, and there's one member of academic staff to every eight students. That's a very high, uh, that's a very good ratio. Uh, and one of the best in the UK. In the UK. The School of Management is slightly separate in some of the things it does. The rest of the university campus is very engineering and technically orientated. So the School of Management sits slightly separate from that. And in that respect, it has its own um, management information resource center that actually sits within the School of Management separate from the main library. And that's because there's a, a whole range of additional services, particularly around data, um, that we are able to provide to the management students, which is not necessarily uh, required by the engineering students. In addition, the, the 
management students have access to information specialists that sit within um, the library to support them with any literature searches or data searches that they may need to carry out. So we have an additional support for that. The other thing I would I would stress is that coming to Cranfield on graduating, you become part of a very wide alumni network. And because this is a solely postgraduate university, the alumni network tends to have a lot of very senior people in it. So joining the network creates a whole new set of opportunities for our students. And there's no doubt that we have uh, alumni in some very uh, prestigious um, uh, jobs and positions worldwide. Um, they're spread fairly widely. The main concentrations will be in the Asia and Europe, but also Africa is growing quite rapidly in terms of our alumni network, but they are spread geographically. There are approximately 67,000 alumni um, from the School of Management, that would be about 21,000, but for the whole university, it's 67. We cover 169 countries in terms of where our alumni are based. We run events with our alumni or we help the alumni host events. Uh, and certainly when I was traveling before the pandemic, I would take the opportunity if in a country to meet up with the alumni. And that's common practice with our faculty. And there are 30 international communities or, or what we would call networks and alumni networks, which are very strong and running a lot of their own activities independently. So it is a, it is a powerful group of, of students, ex-students. Uh, specifically for Thailand, um, we have uh, what's known as the Great Scholarships, which are um, in partnership with the, the British Council. So there are a number of tuition uh, fees of up to 10,000, which will be awarded for Thai applicants. Uh, they apply only to the full-time master's courses in the School of Management. There is a deadline, as you can see, it's the 1st of May. If you want more information on those, um, then those are the links and I can get those so copied across. Okay, so we, we have got targeted scholarships for Thailand. In terms of your next steps, if you want to, we can put you in contact with an alumni or alumnus that can uh, explain that, that what they what they experienced from their degree at Cranfield. Um, you can contact our admission service if you need more information. You can talk to us online or in person if you need to. So if you contact the admissions office, they can arrange uh, a course director to talk to you. Um, we have an informal assessment process, which if you're not sure if you're qualified, you can check your eligibility. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, visiting is a, a little bit restricted, um, but we have this opportunity of a webinar. Um, and start your application. I mean, um, my, my, my ambition is I hope to be able to uh, welcome you to Cranfield um, and for you to tell me that you saw me on this um, on this link today and we can uh, have a cup of coffee and we can just have a discussion about your journey to Cranfield. But there are a number of steps that you can take that can give you the confidence to make that application if you're uncertain. And I thought what I'd do is I'd just finish this piece by actually letting our students talk for themselves. So I'm just going to share this video with you. I'm working um, at a startup at the moment. So having a solid knowledge of entrepreneurship is just completely vital. Uh, at, the moment, at the moment, we're raising Series B. So understanding how that process works, understanding funding, understanding what we can do to acquire drivers, you know, that, that broad contextual understanding of what a startup looks like and how to grow a startup has really just really really valued valued me in, in a startup context yeah 
I really enjoyed the right balance that there is between theory and practice. We spent a lot of time in classes uh, doing theory, but we also had many uh, practical approaches to the financial industry. For example, during um, the Bloomberg um, analysis at the library. That was something that is really useful also, after, that it was use, very useful for me afterwards when I came to work. Another thing is the flexibility of the course. We have the chance to choose from a wide range of elective courses and that's really where students can choose and push their own interest and the things that suits, suits them the most. I use some of the theory that I've learned here and I think using or having the knowledge of how a supply chain operates really helps me in understanding the supply chain of my current company that I'm working for. But also, like I said, the, the soft skills that you have, being able to do a proper presentation, working as teams with people from all across the world, that's something that um, is making my life a lot easier now when working. We learn a lot about market research, so I buy media for the UK and Ireland. So whenever I need to see a Nielsen report or I see like uh, I work with companies like Mediacom, they were introduced to us at the course. So I know how to manage myself better with those kind of companies. So that helped me a lot. OK, I'm going to move into the second part of the presentation, which is just to give you a bit of a taster for um, the lecturing that we undertake or the classes, lecturing is probably not the right word, the sessions that we run. And I've extracted a piece from one of my own uh, modules on freight transport, where we would be discussing and looking at the impact of e-commerce on secondary transportation or delivery of small consignments. So I'm gonna just extract a small piece from that and give you a taste of some of the things that we would be discussing in class. So this is just a piece that's been extracted. So in, in the classroom, we, we would have been discussing the whole issue of what we call omni-channel logistic services, or, or basically where a company has multiple ways of reaching you as the final consumer. So they may have retail, they may have um, uh, online and various, various different ways of actually reaching you as a final consumer. And we'll have gone through a discussion of what we call the fulfillment landscape and why it's a difficult space to be in. And the piece that I'm going to extract and discuss is this last mile. So that final journey to you, whether that's um, to your home, whether that's to a collection point, whatever it is, but the very last piece of, of the puzzle, the final delivery. And the logistical challenges that the last mile throws up is, is all around people want it quicker. So there's a shorter delivery time. So it's difficult to consolidate and plan. Um, higher schedule reliability is being demanded by customers. So they want more accurate estimation of when they're going to receive their product. They want delivery flexibility in as much as they want to choose how they get it. So they may want it to deliver to the home. They may want to collect it from a designated point, but they want to make that decision. Um, they want to be able to track it. So they want to know where it is. Um, they need a very high they, they need a very high degree of return capability. So if they don't like it, they want an easy returns process. Yeah, and there is a high degree of returns happening in certain sectors. Um, for companies, there's the problem that, that often means that vehicles are underutilized. Um, they're not very productive. Um, they use small vehicles and lots of them, which are often inefficient, uh, often lead to congestion and increased emissions, and it adds to the urban congestion in the uh, urban environment. So it has a whole range of environmental impacts. So it, it's a difficult area to manage uh, as, a, as an organization. And, and the problem for companies is if you look at the last mile costs, they are significant when compared to um, the inbound costs, if you like. So 
this is a famous study done by a US company that looked at um, the sourcing of a blouse out of the Far East coming into the US market. So the, the blouse is going to sell for $30 in the US. Uh, it costs them $5 to purchase it in the Far East. They ship it into the US. There's a whole range of costs associated with that. Okay. So from $5, by the time they've landed it in the United States, uh, that they've actually spent now between 5.9 and 6.4 dollars so they've added somewhere around a dollar to a dollar and a half of additional cost on top of the purchase price but the last mile delivery to the retail store or through to you as an individual adds a significant amount of additional cost and that is all detracting from the profit margin of this blouse. So the last mile delivery can push the total cost of supplying that product to you up as high as $17.4. So that's a huge erosion of profitability. And what is happening, of course, is that Everything up until the United States is in consolidated large scale movements. So economies of scale work for you. As soon as you start getting down to individual product movements, you're into disaggregated flows, which lose all the economies of scale and therefore costs go up very, very quickly. And that's the conundrum. That's the paradox that companies are facing. How do we maintain a profitability yeah, when the cost of actually delivering these types of services to customers is extremely expensive? Yeah. And for those companies that own both physical retail stores and operate in an e-commerce market, they have both the cost of retail property to manage as well as trying to be in the e-commerce market at the same time. So there's a lot of cost questions for companies to answer. So there are lots of initiatives that are taking place. And, and in the classroom, we, we would look at these in a lot more detail. But, but the issue is that companies are trying all sorts of initiatives. And those range from things like own account private fleet. So um, in the US, Amazon is starting to invest in its own transportation fleet. In other parts of the world, we see bike and motorcycle scooter couriers. Um, so a good example of that would be Flipkart in India or Snapdeal. We see uh, increasing use of parcel or station lockers where parcels are delivered to um, secure lo lockers, which people can collect at their own convenience. We have crowdsourced delivery type activities. Um, so Instacart or GoGo Van, GoGo Van is in Hong Kong. Um, about 40,000 van drivers have signed up for a crowdsourced delivery system. We've got pick and collect where people actually go to retail stores or locations to collect products. And we have all sorts of um, weird and wonderful ideas floating around, around drones or robotic deliveries. And we do know that investments in this area have been increasing rapidly and stepping up. So the last known figure I have was, okay, it's somewhat old now, 1.8 billion in 2014. The last figure I saw was something like 3 billion in 2019 for startup investments in this area. So there's a lot of initiatives that people are trying. But I guess the one that everybody starts to talk about or gets excited about is, is this idea about drones. So I'm going to share this short video and then I'm going to get you just to think for about a minute uh, about the implications of this. Ooh. Bear with me a second.
will come up in a second. Try this link instead. Hmm. Okay. whatever reason that's that's not running okay i'll come back to that in a second apologies for whatever reason that video is not running i'm just gonna come to this one the um the process that Amazon has gone through is to try and understand what their delivery costs are. And I, I've been working um, with one of our alumni um, who's actually a business development director at, at Amazon. And he's shared with me some of his costing details. I'm not going to share with you the, the whole investment appraisal, but they've gone through a process of looking at what drone delivery would actually potentially cost them to offer to you as a client. So the idea is that they would be able to offer, offer to you drone delivery of any item up to approximately two and a half kilograms within a 10 mile radius of their warehouse or distribution center. And they believe that the delivery would cost approximately a dollar. Okay. And you'd get that within 30 minutes of placing a delivery. So if you compare that to the other services that they offer, so a one to two hour delivery, somewhere around about $7.9 a next day delivery somewhere around between 4.9 and 5.9 dollars so the drone delivery itself would be a lot cheaper okay now in class we would go through the full investment appraisal i'm not going to do that here but when they did an evaluation of their product ranges and what they were selling approximately 400 million packages weigh less than 2.25 kilograms and are within a 10 mile radius of their warehouses. So 400 million packages could potentially be delivered by drone, okay? And the full investment appraisal actually comes up with a figure slightly lower than a dollar but it would be a dollar for them to actually deliver it to you. That'd be the charge they'd offer to you. What we would then do in class is we would then look at, okay, so if this is a lower cost, what are the positives and the negatives? What are the pros and cons of actually trying to put this into service? And we would then break the students up and we would allow you to do that in a group discussion to come back with whether you think this is realistic or not. OK. And we would spend some time looking at the, at the investment appraisal and, and trying to understand whether these positives and negatives could be overcome. So we just spent that time in groups. We would facilitate the groups. We'd, we'd sort of push the conversations along. But in general, what we'd end up with is something like this. We've, we've come to our conclusions. It is a lower cost. Amazon likes the technological perception that drones brings to the company. It would be a very rapid service response. 
it would be a consistent service because it's not impacted by environmental congestion and it would be zero emissions because the drones would be electrical yeah but on the negative side there are concerns about hacking and diversion of the, of the drones safety issues about drones if they have accidents or products become detached from the drone security of the of or theft of the product so how secure is the delivery does weather affect the service particularly wind so high winds might make the service unviable so there may be days you can't offer the service there could be issues of if there's a lot of drones um, in the airspace they could bump into each other so just controlling the airspace drones could get lost so how accurate is their gps systems there could be airspace restrictions so you are not going to be able to use these around airports you may not be able to use this if there's military airspace that's uh, reserved for use there could be customer restriction problems so currently amazon has a drone delivery service which is licensed which is operating in Australia, in Canberra, for delivering products. But Canberra, everybody lives in a house and has a back garden for delivery. If I go to Hong Kong and I look at the large tower blocks, where would you make your delivery to if you're trying to use drones? So the actual makeup of the urban space may make it difficult. And there's a whole use of, well, how is proof of delivery determined? So how do you know that the person receiving the product is the correct person? Okay, so there are a whole range of things that we would discuss and then say, how would you overcome those problems? What are the alternatives? Okay, so in that sense, there's a whole range of things which, 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 which happen that we would then take and explain in a lot more detail. Okay, now, the thing that I would say is that this drone delivery where everybody's looking at moving things by air, uh, I live in a relatively new city. Um, it has a lot of open space and wide pavements. I don't get air drone deliveries, but I do have a robot that delivers to my door. It travels at four miles an hour on the pavement and it's about the size of a large cool box and it delivers groceries and it costs me uh, one pound for a delivery and it delivers within a five mile radius of the retail store so i can get deliveries by a robot which is quite bizarre and strange at first yeah so we are seeing some robotic delivery type processes and drones is just one of them. So there are all sorts of weird and wonderful things that are creeping in into the market and finding a, a space. There will be no one single solution. There'll be multiple solutions, but there's some very interesting things going on. Okay. Unfortunately, the video didn't want to work. I don't know why that is, but... Um, but I'm hoping you, you got the point that the thing I would stress is the session that we would have done would, would have not would, would only had a few slides as we have here. It is the work we do with the groups discussing and looking at the options and how those negatives can be resolved. OK. OK. So let me finish on that. That was just an extraction of what we would, would would have done in class okay and i want to move straight on to the q a and allow you the opportunity to ask me questions about um, the courses at cranfield any concerns you have about studying in the uk what life is like at cranfield university so please feel free to ask your questions uh, and i'll do my best to answer them So is there anything coming through? Hello, Siri. Thank you, Melvin, for the wonderful presentation. Hi, Siri. Okay. 
Yes. Yeah. So we have few questions on YouTube, but the, uh, the those questions are in Thai language. Can you please translate those questions? Sure. Yes. Let me check the question first. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Siri. Siri. Okay. Okay, I'll so stop. yeah, we oh. yeah, we'll start with the QA session now, Siri. Yes, let me oh. see first. Okay. Uh, okay, the student said that if they have like the gap year, about five year, can, can you hear me? I okay. can, but I didn't catch okay. the first part of that. So the student said that if they, okay, so said, uh, they said that if, if uh, they have the, the uh, uh, gap year, about like five year, can he apply for the master? If he, if you have a gap year before coming to Cranfield, yes, yes, the, there's no restriction on when you can apply. So if you have a gap year after doing your first degree before you come to Cranfield, that's fine. There's no, there's no problem with that. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, uh, they also ask about the uh, accommodation. Yeah, there's accommodation on campus. And in fact, yes. there's increased. In fact, we've built some more recently. So capacity for accommodation has increased. And but it's always best to apply as early as you can to guarantee the type of accommodation that you want, because there's different types. Yeah, so is, is there safe? Like, oh, what are the like, environment? around there i didn't quite catch that the, the the accommodation is of different types so there are there's accommodation with catering there's accommodation with shared kitchens there's different types it's all on campus um okay literally it's all on campus so i mean the students that apply relatively early then they should get a camp campus accommodation if you apply late in the year then it's you may not get the choice you want mm -hmm. okay thank you for the answer okay uh, they also have another question like what i ask god do they need for the management and operate sustainability costs the, the the IELTS score, the IELTS yeah. score required is 6.5. And for okay. the MSc in management course, it's seven. But for the other MSCs, it's 6.5. And they would need a balanced set of scores. So if they, if they had a really bad score in one element, that would not be sufficient. So they do need to have a good balance, but 6.5 overall. Okay, so another question is, can they enroll the myself like in management and human resources management if uh if they don't have any experience. Uh yes. Um you would not have to have um, a background in HR or a first mm -hmm. degree in HR to do the HRM course. It is a conversion course and it will be CIPD accredited. Okay.
Also, the last question is about like, what are the top five employers for the Cranfield? The top five careers at Cranfield? Yes. Um, that would be very hard to answer because the, <laughs> the diversity of careers is immense. But I would say approximately one third of our students go into industry, uh, which would either be in some form of manufacturing or process industry. Another third would go into the service sector, so um, into the finance sector, into the consultancy sector, yeah. And the other third would go into government or, or non-commercial environments, so NGOs, uh, aid agencies, social, uh, on, social enterprises. So it would pro broadly be about a third, a third and a third, but it's a very broad range. Okay, thank you for your answer. Okay. okay. I mean, I, I think surprising nobody's asked me about what are the what are the current conditions like for studying in the UK given um, the COVID situation. So mm -hmm. it's probably I can explain what has happened to us this year and what we're planning to do in the next year. Yeah, surely you can. <laughs> So that, that will probably give you some understanding of what we've had to do. Um, up until so from September to the end of December, um, restrictions meant that there was social distancing required for lectures. However, we managed to deliver over 70% of our content face to face as normal. Um, and we had some online delivery, but it was face to face as normal. That was quite unusual in the UK. Most universities went to just online. We did not. Um, we, we delivered uh, as much as we could face to face and we committed to doing 70% face to face. From January through to um, what's now going to be the 12th of April, we were required under government law to deliver online and we did do so and we have maintained studies that way and we are moving back to face to face as of the 12th of April. For September, assuming there are no additional um, issues, we hope to be back to face to face as normal or at least 70 70% 70 face to face. Uh, and we are, the UK is probably one of the few countries which is well advanced with its vaccination program. So we've now got just over a third of the population vaccinated and that is moving ahead very fast indeed. So most of us believe that we'll be, we'll be back to virtually to normal September, October, face to face. Yeah. So that that's the good news story that, that we've gone through. So we're very well advanced with our vaccination. I certainly had mine. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your information. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure that's a, a question people would have were probably a bit worried to ask, but but yeah, but it's sure. but it's fine. We've we've coped very well. Um, and we've provided some uh, lots of additional support for our students during this period of time as well. Okay. Thank you so much, Melvin and Lee, for your valuable information. So we are at the end of the seminar. Do you want to put anything forward for the students in the end, from your end? Yes, I mean, I, all I would say to you is that uh, Cranfield has a, is a, is a, is a, is a university that you might not have heard of because we're only postgraduate. But I can assure anybody who applies to Cranfield, the employers, the companies, the industry that we work with know us very well. So it's no barrier to career progression at all because once you get out into industry, into government, etc., they know Cranfield very well. Okay, that's my last comment. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. Lee, uh, okay. do you want to say anything to the students from your end? 
Okay, um, I have sent some of the links uh, in the chat box. So students can actually click on that and download whatever information that they need. So um, for other information, they can actually go to the website, accommodation funding or um, any courses under the School of Management. Uh, other than that, um, for students, please put in your application. We have uh, great scholarships going on. The deadline is 1st of May. Uh, it's £10,000 towards your tuition fees. Please um, go to the website and just Google Cranfield University great scholarships and uh, you can get the information there. Um, for more uh, information or if you need any assistance, please go to SIUK and get back to your counsellor. Thank you. Thank My you last, so much. Yeah, yeah, last comment. Uh, last comment. I would love to welcome you to Cranfield in, in October and sit down and have a cup of coffee with you. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for your time today. Bye. Thank you all for joining us today. Bye. Bye.